Hi everyone, I want to welcome you to our webinar today. The topic is Don't Let Time Kill Deals. And I've had many of you send me emails asking why we're doing this free training call. And I have a few reasons. Number one, the reason I became a trainer is so that I can help all of you make more money and be more successful. Um, I love the, the, uh, the headline in the most recent Fordyce letter when it said 2014 was a record year until you see what 2015 is going to be. So this year is the year that you can break records. This is a year that you can earn more than you've ever earned. But there's also a lot of problems going on, on out there, you know, because of, you know, the competition for top talent and the candidate-driven market. So what my hope is, is that you do enjoy, you know, the information today. And, you know, and what I would suggest that all of you do, I'm going to give you a tremendous amount of information. I'm going to give you eight, I mean, 11 different ways you can create urgencies with clients. I'm going to give you 15 ways that you can create urgency with candidates, and then we're going to talk about doing right things at the right time. So there's quite a bit of information. What I suggest you do is write down what resonates with you. You know, when I'm going through and doing the training, if you try to change too much, you're not going to change anything at all. You know, and if you come to the call and say, gee, this is a great call, if you don't implement something, this is a waste of your time. Whenever I tell people I don't believe that there's power in education, they kind of look at me like, wait a minute, Barb, you're a trainer. How can you say that? There is no power in education or in attending a session like this unless you change something, unless you implement something. If you want to get different results, you've got to change the way you work your desk. And all of you are in a comfort zone. When you arrived at your office this morning, you pretty much did things the way you do you know, every morning. And so what I'm hoping as a result of this webinar is that you change some things. And so let's get into today's topic, um, you know, don't let time kill deals. In real estate, and real estate is basically the industry that I came out of before I got in the staffing and recruiting industry, all I heard about was location, 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 and it was true. That was the most important thing in real estate. In staffing and recruiting, it's all about timing. It's timing, timing, timing. Time can work to your advantage or time can kill your deals. Today we're going to discuss three basic areas. The first area is how do you create urgency with your clients? And I don't care if you're doing, you know, contingency, direct, if you're doing temp or high-level contract. You know, everybody's having the same problem with timing. How do you create urgency with candidates? And we all know they're in control right now. And by the way, they know it too. And, and what should you be doing at the right time? You know, I know a lot of people that work very hard at what we do, but they're not making great money. You know, they're working hard, they're putting in the hours, but they're not putting their focus on the right things at the right time. And that's why I want to cover that as the last part about the presentation. You do a tremendous amount of work for free unless you work retained search. You know, on the direct side of our profession, you only generate profits when you make a placement, when the fee is paid, and when the person makes it past the guarantee period. On the temp and contract side of our profession, you are only compensated when you fill an assignment or a contract and when your invoices are paid. And it's for these reasons that it's imperative that you create urgency in order to make fills and close placements. Every time you're pointing your finger out at somebody else, I want you to think about this for a minute. Every time you're blaming your candidates or you're blaming your clients or you're blaming the job market or you're blaming that this is a candidate-driven marketplace, there's three fingers pointing back at you. You know, we can't control what other people do. The only thing we can control is how we react to what they do and our actions. You know, the results that, that we enjoy as a result of us changing the way we're working with clients and candidates. You know, and again, it is a candidate-driven marketplace. And I hear, I just got back from Florida. I spoke at a conference. And it was interesting because everybody was complaining on how hard it is to find talent, that they could be making so much more money and closing so many more deals if they only had the talent. And I said to them, don't you understand, that's the best marketplace for you. And they all kind of looked at me, you know, if it was easy to find people, nobody would need us. And so when it's a candidate-driven marketplace and it's hard to find talent, that's very good for us. I believe that all of you that are in the profession right now, this is the best time to be in the staffing prof and, and recruiting profession in history. You've got baby boomers aging. You've got so many professions that are that basically people are retiring and there's not near enough people to replace it. Over 50% of the workforce is now working a flexible work schedule. They're working temp. They're working contract. They're working two part-time jobs instead of one full-time job. So those of you that are in the temp and contract marketplace, it's very good for you. You know, so when you, when you think about all the things that frustrate you and how time is killing some of your deals, we're going to give you solutions today. 
on how to eliminate this, but really embrace the fact that this could be your year. The other thing I want to say to all of you that are listening to my voice is I don't know what you produced in January, but I know every one of you have set goals for what you want to do this year. And if you didn't hit your goal in January and you just erased the board and you didn't hit your goal, what you basically have told yourself is, well, I'm giving up my goal and I'm giving up my dreams the first month of the year. You know, and I always tell owners and managers, never erase goals. Whatever you didn't produce, if you did not hit your goal in January, the difference between the goal you set and what you produce, that difference should be added to future months. Now, if it was a small amount, you might add it to February. But say it was a larger amount, say January wasn't your greatest month, then divide it by 11 and add a little bit to every month in the remainder of the year, and you should do that the rest of the year. Because, again, you don't want to give up your dreams in the first month of the year. So whatever you didn't produce in January has to be added to future months. All right, let's get to our first main topic, which is create urgency with clients. And I'm going to give some of my tips. I'm going to separate the tip between direct and tip and contract because sometimes it's a little bit different. And some tips work, you know, for both, you know, direct and tip and contract. So tip number one, when you're working direct placements, Obtain three interviewing times from your clients and get a specific target date to fill the order to ensure that you book sendouts. I don't care what discipline you're in, what niche you're in, if you're doing temp contract or direct, your job is to get people in front of hiring authorities every single day. If you want to have a better month in February than you did in January, send more people to your client's first interview. My definition of a send out is a candidate in front of a hiring authority first interview, phone interview or face to face. And when you get three interviewing times up front from the clients and a specific target date to fill, now you know the timing of the order. And if they say, well, you've never asked for interviewing times before, you can say it is so competitive that once we get the top talent and we're talking to them, we want to basically nail down the interview when we got them on the phone before they accept something else. Show the person, whenever you want somebody to do something different, you want your clients to work with you a little bit differently, you have to show them the what's in it for them. Every human being that you deal with, your clients, your candidates, your coworkers, have a big tattoo on their forehead, W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me? You know, and so when you're talking to clients, when you're talking to candidates, when you're interacting with your coworkers, you've got to show them the benefit to them to do what you want them to do. Get an alternate name of somebody who can confirm the interviews and send a copy of your job order to everybody in the interviewing process. You've got to understand the problems that exist to test the urgency to fill. And, and you might ask, wait a minute, this is a lot of stuff. You're asking me to do a lot of things here. You're asking me to get three interviewing times. You're asking me to get a specific target date. Because you know what most of your orders say? ASAP or immediately. And that's not what the client said. You've got to say, what is your specific target date to fill? And if they can't give you a target date and they can't talk to you about the problem that exists, then that's not necessarily an urgent order. Is that an order that you want to put your valuable time on? We're talking about timing here and how timing can till de kill deals. Say that when you ask for a target date to fill and you would have put immediately and they say, well, March 1st or March 15th, and now you realize you can't start too soon because you're going to lose your candidates. And how many times have you written an order and you've got candidates that surfaced and you can't get a hold of the hiring authority? Nobody is returning your call. Well, now when you have an alternate name of somebody who can confirm interviews, you've got the three interviewing times. All you do now is call that person and say, okay, for the interview on Monday, for the interview on Tuesday, for the interview on Wednesday, here's the candidates. The reason I'm telling you to send a copy of your job order to everybody in the interviewing process is simple. Over 50% of the time, they will make major changes. Often, they've had somebody in a job for three years, and when they go to refill it, they use the job order from three years ago, and now the hiring authority wants somebody that had the talents of the person that was in the job, and those talents were not on the job order three years ago. You know, most of our clients are established, and over 50% of the time, they make major changes. We've had them change the title. We've had them change the salary level. We've had them absolutely change, you know, what had to be there, the minimum skills that had to be there. So if you really want to fill more orders and you want to book more sendouts, if you follow this one, these tips that you're, that you're looking at right now on the direct side of the business, it will change. Your, your job order to fill ratio will dramatically, you know, decrease. You're going you're gonna to be filling many, many more of your job orders. On the temp side, those of you that are working high volume, light industrial temp, 
where there is no interview, okay? Your job is, your, your candidate is sent to a job, and if the client is not satisfied, they don't retain the services of the temp employee. Obviously, in office support or higher level temp assignments, there can be an interview process, and you should follow the guidelines for direct placements. You know, but even when you're working a high, you know, a high, fast-paced environment, you know, you still want to, you know, prep those candidates so they understand they're going to be sent out quickly. And you, you need to send a copy of what you're working on every so often to those light industrial clients because I'm telling you, they will change the orders. In office support, what you want to do is tie up the lunch hours. You know, if you've got somebody on a different assignment and you want them to interview on an assignment where there are interviews, okay, the only time they can go is lunch hours. So what you do is you tie up the lunch hours to make sure that your candidates get on the lunch hour appointments. Tip number two on direct, you've got to let your clients know your candidates have other interviews. The minute you book an interview for one of your candidates, you've got to market them to other employers. Because if you don't send them on more than one interview, believe me, somebody else will or they're going to surface jobs themselves. The internet, job boards, you know, website postings, employment pages of clients has made it very easy for candidates to find interviews on their own. You know, there's a formula, you know, that 3 plus 3 equals 3. You want to get three interviews for every candidate. You want to have three people going into final interviews with every client. You know, if somebody is crossed out, you want, you want to replace that person. But you've got to let your, your clients know that, that these candidates are actively interviewing because everybody wants what everybody else wants. On the temp side, let your clients know that the candidates you're sending are in high demand and that you're sending them to this client because you value them as an established client. This person is coming off of a contract. They're coming off of a temp assignment. I know they're the caliber you normally hire. I know they're in demand, and they're looking at several opportunities, but I've told them about you because I know this is the caliber that you would love to hire. When can we get the two of you on a phone call? When can we get the two of you together? You know, you, every, again, everybody else wants what everybody else wants. Tip number three in direct, find out what is missing from the candidates they've already interviewed. I've never understood why we don't ask that question. When they come to us, normally they've done some interviews already, and all you have to do is find out what's missing from the people they've interviewed so far, and now you can fine-tune your search effort to make better matches. Because if you find that particular skill that's been missing, you have a chance of getting a hire. On the temp side, you want to identify the challenges of your hiring authority. And you want to send in candidates who can help you know, him or her solve their issues. Again, light industrial is fast paced, high volume, but you want to identify problems so your candidates can provide solutions and you share the problem areas with the candidates that you're putting out on these jobs. Tip number four is you've got to outline your SOPs, your standard operating procedures, and set up realistic expectations and time frames. If you begin your process too quick, you're going to lose your candidates. If you begin your process too slow, someone else could get hired before you present the talent. And the problem is now, our clients want us to you know, give them the best candidates faster than our competition. So their standards as far as the caliber of person they want to see has not gone down at all, but they expect us to work much faster. And that's why it's also important for you to realize what business you know you can fill. Every one of you know what order, that if it comes in the office, you can fill it. Every one of you know what that business is. And that's why I always tell owners and managers, make sure that your people doing client development understand your best business. If I'm placing project managers and I'm placing a lot of other positions, but I realize that 70% of our placements and fills are project managers on a direct side as well as a contract side, then I'm going to tell my sales team what I want you to do is really go out there and write as many project manager job orders as you can because I realize that that way, you know, my, my recruiters can build up a pipeline of project managers where they can fill them much faster. And, and when the salespeople are out there writing orders, you want them to write orders that you can fill. Even if you're working with a VMS, if you're doing temp and you're working with a VMS where you're judged on submittals, you know, you want to keep your report card, you know, strong with them and you're judged on submittals, I would still know what I'm filling with them and I would put all my efforts on the jobs I know I can fill. That's where I would really put my efforts and then I would just send resumes out of my database for everything else so that my report card stays high but I'm putting my real efforts on those titles I know I'm going to fill. S tip number five, stress the what's in it for me to your client as it relates to timing and keeping the hiring process moving forward. And, and what I want to say to all of you, isn't it interesting that when you send in a rock star, what happens to the timing? 
Um, anytime we've sent in a rock star, all of a sudden the first and second interviews are con you know combined. The process starts speeding up. And so sometimes the reason time is killing deals is because you're not sending in the rock stars. You know, and when your clients realize what's in it for me, all they want to do is have us make them look good. That's what they're worried about. You know, they don't care about us. They care about themselves, who they hire. If they make the right hire, they're a hero. If they make the wrong hire, then they take the blame. And so our job is to make these hiring authorities look good. Tip number six is share articles about the competition for reliable talent. I'm speaking to a lot of corporate audiences right now, basically explaining why they should use us. Because I realize that most trainers in our profession train our profession. And there's not that many people out there talking to corporate America about why they should use us. And it's interesting because when I tell clients, you know, we want to be your trusted advisor, we're more consultative, their response to me is always, Barb, the only time I hear from a recruiter is when they're making money off of me. They never send me an article. They are not consultative at all. You know, in fact, after they make a hire with me, they don't even call me to see if the person's working out. It's all about them earning their commission. We've got to change that perception. You know, what you want to be perceived at is a workforce workplace expert. You're a trusted advisor. And when you're working with people, you want to say that to them. My goal is to be your trusted advisor. You know, you should be subscribing to every trade publication that your clients and candidates read, and you should be sending articles, you know, really strong articles that you're reading in these trade publications to your clients to show them that you're reading what they're reading. Half the time they don't look at things, but if you've got an article that you think that would interest them, send it along. Do not only talk to your clients when you're making money. Tip number seven is you've got to debrief the person who has the highest level of interest, not always the candidate, who you feel is the best match. When I first started in this profession, I was always taught to debrief the candidate first. You debrief the candidate first, then you debrief the client. And I've learned now, since the marketplace has flipped over, often we debrief the person who has the highest level of interest. If you're working in IT, you're working in engineering, you're in biotech, you know, you're in, in one of the fields that is really hot right now, you know that these clients have two or three things that they're looking at. You know, and you're trying to entice them. So what you want to do is debrief the client first if they're most interested to get ammunition. So when you're talking to the candidate, you can say, while that client interviewed you, pick up the phone and call me and let me share some of the things they said. You know, because you, you know, again, you, you debrief the person who has the highest level of interest in this marketplace. Tip number eight is you want to give specific examples how time kills deals. And let me tell you one of the best ways to do this. Say that you're working with a client and you're just frustrated because their process is too long, yet it's a company you want to represent. It's a company that your candidates want to work for and you don't know what to do. Well, the next time they call in an order or they give you a temp assignment or a contract, what you want to do is send in candidates that are very actively interviewing. Send in people that are close to accepting an offer. And then by the time your client calls you back, um, they're all placed in jobs. Because there's no better way to show them how competitive the marketplace is than to have them interested in somebody and before they've even interviewed them, the person is off the market. Tip number nine, I'm going to break this up between direct and temp. You want to explain to your clients how you're going to muck up the process. Anytime one of your candidates is screened out, you're going to send an additional candidate. Because your goal is to have two or three people in the final interviewing process of your clients. If you do nothing more than, than really embrace the last sentence on the screen right now, if you start having two to three people in the final interviewing process with your clients in direct placement, I guarantee you, you will make more money, you will be more successful in 2015. The problem is when you're sending people in, it's like you work a job, you start with three or four candidates, and by the time you get to the final interview, you have one person or you have no people. And what if you only have one person and they accept a counteroffer? Now you're starting from scratch. You want to have one, two, and three. You want to have backup candidates. And you and I both know that often the best candidate surfaces when you're close to an offer. And I've done that. I've sat on somebody. I haven't sent them in. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm waiting for an offer. This candidate's great, but I'm not going to send them in. And all of a sudden, the process comes to a screeching halt. And one of my competitors sent in the person. And guess who got hired? The person that I sat on. And so, you know, you explain to your clients why it benefits them. Say your goal is to get two or three people in final interviews. They're going to love that. Now, the only time this doesn't work, again, is on the temp side, especially if you're working a VMS. They don't let you backfill. But on direct placement, if it's, you know, direct contact with the hiring authority, they'll love that you're doing it. If you write a temp assignment for five specific types of individuals and you surface six, you want to send them. 
you know, it's interesting because often, especially in light industrial temp, I did light industrial when I first entered this profession, and I did a lot of business with the steel mills, and it was funny, they tell me they need six people, and I would send in seven, and then they go, and they would get a call, and they go, you just sent over seven, and I said, you know, I was worried that somebody might not show up, and they say, we'll keep all seven. Almost always, the client will hire because they've got a high volume of positions, especially at like call centers, light industrial temp. You know, they're looking for high volume. They're working with other people, including you. And so, you know, a tip is just send the extra person, and, and you'd be amazed at how many times they're hired. Tip number 10, you've got to provide an update on open orders and assignments every Friday afternoon by phone. Explain, you know, what you've done so far. If you haven't been able to surface talent, you want to tell them why. Because when you're trying to get clients to alter specs on an order or on an assignment or a contract, when they're first giving it to you, they're thinking, well, you know, how do you know that? How do you know they're not out there? But if you call uh, every Friday afternoon and say, this is what we've done, this is how many people we've talked to, let me tell you why we're not able to fill this. Is there any flexibility? Now you're talking to them that you worked for them. And let me tell you another big complaint I hear from my corporate audiences all the time. They say, you know what's funny? You recruiters, or they refer to us as you people, you people call us, you want our business. We give you an order and then we never hear from you. We don't know if you worked 30 minutes on our order, if you just ignored it, if you put in a few hours on it because you never talked to us. You know, we never hear from you. How are we supposed to know what you're doing? And the reason I'm telling you to pick up a phone is 80% of all emails are not even opened. You know, and that I got that statistic at a recent technology conference, and that does include junk and spam. But most emails are not open unless the person sees what's in it for them. And that's why when you call somebody, you don't ask for an update. You don't ask for a status report because that's all about you. You offer additional information and then people will call you back. You know, but you again, it's amazing how many times when you get a person on the phone and if they don't answer and you get their voicemail, you leave a voicemail giving them an update and asking them, you know, when it's convenient for the two of you to talk because you've exhausted, you know, everything you can do. You want to know if there's anything that can be altered so you can fill the business. Tip number 11 is you want to provide written expectations. I've had my training clients doing this for two years now, and it has changed most of their lives because the truth of the matter is none of you conduct your business the same way. What you want to do with clients is you want to give them in writing what they can expect from you. They don't realize everything you do. They have no idea of the work involved in what we do. And then you tell them what you need from them in order to attract the best talent that they're going to hire. You know, timing and a sense of urgency are included in these expectations. And you want to hear something really funny. When I talk to clients, they complain that we don't communicate with them. And I find that interesting because that's always one of our biggest complaints, that they're not communicating with us. And my clients, my training clients that have provided written expectations, they said, Barb, it's so amazing because now they know up front what to expect and they're not confused and the process goes so much smoother, so much faster. And so write down written expectations and let them know all the work you're doing for them. Let's flip over now to the candidate side and I want to give you 15 ways to create urgency with candidates. Number one, get your paperwork completed up front to screen candidates you know you cannot place in a job. You know, you should have, you know, a, a series of screening questions that you ask every single person you talk to. You know, and, and tip number two is right along with that. You've got to learn to conduct a courtesy interview for the 95% of candidates you will not place and provide resources that can assist them. And that's the number. We place less than 5% of the people that send us resumes or call us. And that's the statistic internationally. It's not only in the United States. It's the United States, Canada, South Africa, the UK. Any places that I've done training in, it's the same exact statistic. And who calls you the most? It's the 95% of candidates you're not going to place in a job. If you're talking to somebody, you're not even going to send paperwork if in that initial screening conversation you realize this is somebody you're not going to place in a job. You've got to give them resources. You've got to give them something that will help them find a job so they don't call you. If you give them one piece of free advice, they've now designated you their career consultant. And every time you talk to them, every time you take their incoming update call or their status calls or give them free advice, you might as well just take money out of your pocket and burn it because you cannot put your focus on the 95% of the people you will not place. You've got to focus on those people that you know you can place. 
Do not waste time conducting a full interview or offering free career advice. You could put 60 to 90 minutes back in your day if you just focused on the 5% of people that you're going to place. But again, offer you know other resources to people you're not going to place. Tip number three on the direct side, prepare your candidates to interview. Explain that sending them on an interview will help you fine-tune their search. You know, in other words, I, I believe I know what you're looking for, but I want to make sure. Sometimes you have to go out on an interview and give me feedback, and that allows me to fine-tune. When I get your feedback after an interview, it helps me fine-tune my efforts. On the TEB side, assure your candidates you're not going to waste their time. And only send them on jobs you know that they're going to accept. Tip number four, use these six words. I use these six words constantly. I take my direction from you. Because that encourages candidates to give you directives, while they also flex on their availability. You know, when you say, I take my direction from you, it, it makes them want to give you directions, want to, you know, tell you exactly what they're looking for. Tip number five, ask every candidate where they want to work and why. Because this will help you send them on multiple interviews. Ask every candidate where they would never work and why. And this helps you identify great recruiting resources. And so you should be asking everybody you interview, where do you want to work and why? And it's just a very easy phone call to say, you know what? I was going to call my best client. Let me explain why I'm calling you. And then you talk about the candidate and why they want to work for the company. Also, if you're a straight recruiter and not working on the client side of the sale at all, when these candidates are telling you where they want to work and why, you need to pass that information along to the salespeople and the people in client development because you're giving them inside information they're not going to find any place else and they can and then they're going to bring in orders that you can fill tip number six you've got to know the time frame to make a change you've got to ask people what their target date is to make a change because sometimes you just move too fast and all of a sudden it went too fast and, and, and they, they don't want to make a decision or when you first interviewed them you only sent them on one job and they said they weren't interviewing and now you have an offer, and now they're disappearing off the face of the earth, and you're wondering what's going on. Well, you know what? They've got two or three other things going now, so their time frame has changed. Every single time you talk to somebody, and this is not, on your, this is not part of this program, but I want to add in this, this extra tip, and this is both for clients and candidates. Every time you talk to somebody, you start out your conversation in the exact same way. Has anything changed since the last time we talked? Because when you start doing that, you're going to be amazed at all the things that change. You're dealing with human beings that change things all the time. And that will help you fine-tune on what's most important to them right now. Tip number seven, you've got to know when their next promotion and their next raise, as well as the details and the cost of their current benefit package. Because this is their counteroffer. And I don't know that many of you that are doing direct placement and are listening to my voice, I don't know many recruiters that have not been stung by a counteroffer in the last few months. It, it's just becoming ridiculous, you know, and I know I've done many programs for my training clients on, on how do you stop counteroffers because it's gut-wrenching when you have a no-show or a no-start or a counteroffer, but you've got to know what their next promotion and raise is, you know, because truly that is their counteroffer. Number eight, tip eight, you want to share the time frame of your client and always add some additional time. If your client tells you they want to hire by February 15th, I might say February 20th. I'm going to add on some time just because I'd much rather have it come in a few days earlier than to have them waiting and all of a sudden the offer is not coming through and the, the candidate starts pulling themselves because they don't want to be rejected. Tip number nine is don't ever tell your candidate they're the front runner, they're the only one being considered. Everybody wants what everybody else wants. They've got to know there's competition because the, it'll enhance their level of interest. You also, tip number 10, you've got to stay informed of interviews and possible offers. You've got to know their offers better than they do and share the information with your clients. Again, everybody else wants what everybody else wants, but they need to know the types of opportunities these people are considering and that will speed up your client's process when they realize, okay, wait a minute, they have an offer coming down. If they're interested, I, I better speed this up. Tip number 11, you've got to make sure that you've closed them on money. Urgency will not exist if the offer is lower than anticipated. You know, when you make somebody an offer, that's the reward for all your hard work. You shouldn't be in a sweat because the offer came in much lower than you thought. You should be closing the clients and the candidates. You want to close the candidates lower, the clients higher, so when the offer comes through, it's more than your candidate had anticipated, hopefully. Tip number 12, tie in what's most important to this person to your client. If you want to know why your candidates are talking to you, ask them 
What are the five things you'd change about your current job if you were your boss? This is the real reason they're talking to you. Think about this. They say, I wasn't looking. You called me. Yet when you ask them to send you a resume, they, they emailed it over to you in two seconds because they had an updated resume. The reason people are talking to you is something is going on at their current company that they have no control over, and that's why they're going to go through the trauma of a change. This also helps you sell against counteroffer. You've got to know the five things they would change about their job if they were their boss. If they only say money and advancement, guess what? They're using you to accept a counteroffer. Suggest that they go ask for the raise now. Say, I don't want to jeopardize the trust you have with your company. Go ask for the raise now. If you don't get it, come back and I'll be glad to represent you. But if the only reason somebody is thinking about a change is money and advancement, they're going to take a counteroffer. And even if they say their companies are not going to offer them a counteroffer, you'd be amazed. I mean, it's just it's just happening, you know, in all segments of our profession and in all, you know, all facets of our profession. Tip number 13, you've got to listen for red flags during interviews or when you're presenting as an existing opportunity and during your preps and debriefs. You need to hit red flags head on. In order to create urgency, there has to be a high, a high level of interest. And you can't just ask a candidate, are you interested in this job? You know, and what is your level of interest? And let's say I have a high level of interest. I suggest you use on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being you would accept this offer today, 1 being you have no interest whatsoever. How would you rate this job? You know, when people start using percentages, I had a recruiter recently say, I asked my candidate if they were interested in the job, and they said, oh, yes, this looks like a great job. And then I used her on a scale of 1 to 10, and he gave me a 5. And I knew I was dead in the water. If they're not giving you a seven or above, you've got to go back and address that because chances are they're not going to accept the offer or they're going to no start. You know, sometimes they'll go on the interview, but then they'll just no start a job, which again is gut wrenching for us. Tip number 14 is never interview for one specific search or temp assignments or contract because you're going to slant your interview and you're not going to know what's really important to the candidate. If I'm interviewing an engineer, and, and I, you know, and, and I basically have a job in mind. I'm going to be asking my engineering candidate everything I need so that I can book a send out and hopefully get, get a placement with this company. And so I'm not going to do a general interview. You should ask every candidate that you interview the exact same questions and do a general interview with everybody. And then once you know what's really important to them, and one of the questions you should be asking them is, you know, why have you accepted jobs in the past and what must be there for you to accept a new job today? You know, give me the five things that you change about your current job if you were your boss. Those two things give you great directives on what has to be there for that candidate to say yes when they get a job offer or to say yes when you present an opportunity to an interview. Tip number 15. Provide written expectations. Know what they can expect from you and what you need from them in order to find them their next logical career move. See, it's interesting. If you make your recruiting calls right, and you can't only depend on job boards and LinkedIn guys because clients are getting tired of getting the same candidates from you that they're getting from their own internal recruiting team who is using LinkedIn Recruiter and is, is basically on the job boards, you know, just like many recruiters are. They expect us to be out there networking and giving them people that they cannot find on their own. And the way you're going to get, you know, increased referrals, I mean, that's a whole different program on how do you really get more referrals. Most of the candidates you get should be referrals from the people that you're currently representing, whether you place them or not. But, you know, if you make your calls right, it makes sense for people. You know, if I'm out there working and you say to me, most people don't retire from their jobs, and the best way to find a job is to, you know, have your credentials in the hands of a good recruiter. I can be your eyes and ears in the job market. You tell me what's most important to you. I'm only going to call you when I have that opportunity. And that's why those written expectations are so important. And you tell them you don't have to call me every day. And that the written expectations also say, my clients hire people with skills, stability, and experience. Unfortunately, we're not able to place everybody that you know, comes to us because of those three things. But we have alternatives. We have resources you can use that can still help you find a job. You know, truthfully, you know, on the candidate side, you've got to focus on that 5% of you know, people that you're going to actually place in a job. Let's talk now about time management. Because I think all of us kind of feel like hamsters in a cage and we're on one wheel and we jump off and we get on another one and it's going faster than the one we were on. You know, where you focus is where you're going to get results, which is why it's important to do the right things on the right time. You can work hard all day and not be as successful if you would just learn to focus on best use of your time. You've got to ask yourself all the time, is this best use of my time? 
Is this best use of my time? If you're not planning your calls every evening before you leave work and you arrive at work in the morning and now you're deciding who to call, you're going to waste 90 minutes just trying to determine who you're going to call the next day. You've got to determine the 20% of what you do that provides you with 80% of your results. And then consistently, you know, look at that every Friday. What's the 20% that gave me 80% of my results? And consistently do more of those tasks. Because, you know, you're not all talented in the same areas. What is it that you do that results in sales? In order to do the right things at the right time, you've got to plan out your day every evening before you leave work. If you don't, okay, your destiny is going to be controlled by the incoming calls versus your planned outgoing calls. I don't know anybody that wants their destiny controlled by other people. Now, if you're not a planner, and I know many of you are sitting as a group right now, and your owner, if your owner is there, a manager is there, they're probably going, see, Barbara said to plan. Now, starting tonight, you've got to plan all your calls. You know and I know that if you're not a planner, there's no way you're going to go from not being a planner to planning out 100% of your calls every night before you leave work. It, you can't do it. It's too time-consuming. It would be too overwhelming. So let me give you step one. And if you're not a planner and, and you're wondering what to implement, one idea to implement as a result of this session, if you're not a planner, list six priorities closest to the money that you've got to complete tomorrow before you leave work. And I want you to do that for one month. I want you to do that for one month. I want you to, to absolutely, every night before you leave work, list six things that are closest to the money that you must complete before you leave work. It takes 21 days to form a new habit. That's why I'm telling you to do this for one month. And then each sub subsequent month after that, you're still going to list the six things you have to do closest to the money, but then you're going to plan 10 of your outgoing calls. And then the next month, you're going to list six things closest to the money and 20 of your outgoing calls until you're finally planning your outgoing calls. You know, during prime time, those hours of 9 to 11.30 and 1.30 to 4, those prime time hours is when you should be making outgoing calls, not that you're searching on LinkedIn to decide who to call. Those are done on non-prime time hours. This is not an 8 to 5 job. This isn't a job. Recruiting is a career. But you know what's wonderful about our career? There are no limits. If you don't like your paycheck, guess what? Your owner doesn't write your paycheck. You do. You know, most of your checks are basically based on your performance. And you've got to understand something. Your owner is not in business to provide a job for you. Your owner is in business to make a profit, or they're not in business. So, you've, you know, your desk is a profit and loss center. All the ideas I'm giving you today are going to help you make your desk a profit center, which is what it must be. Sourcing, research, and some calls need to be made during evening hours. Prepping, debriefing. If people don't have a private office, you, when you're prepping somebody, they can't be going, uh-huh, mm-mm. You've got to be asking them questions and role-playing with them. You know, segmenting your day will help you stay focused on results-oriented activity that will result in production. It's not about how many hours you work or how many calls you make. It's about knowing your individual numbers, stats, and ratios. Each one of you needs to know what results you need every day to attain or surpass the goal set. Even if you're in direct placement, you can predict your production. You know, if you do not hit your numbers one day, you make them up for the following day. Let me give you an example. If I'm, only a rec if I'm recruiting, I'm only doing the recruiting side of the, of the business. I'm not doing client development at all. And I know that I want to make a placement a week. Okay, I know that I want to do that. And I know that I have to book five send-outs before I get a placement. My placement to fill ratio is five to one. Now I know I have to interview three people to book a send-out. So now I know, okay, if, I, if I've got to interview three people to book a send-out and I have to book five send-outs to make a placement, that means I've got to book three interviews every single day. Now, if I know I have to do three interviews every single day to hit my numbers, I'm not going to book three interviews every single day. I'm going to book four or five because guess what? Somebody's going to know show. And if I only do two interviews today, I've got to do four tomorrow. So at the end of the week, I have interviewed 15 people and I book five send-outs because then I know I'm going to make a placement. You know, whatever numbers you don't hit, you make up for the following day. This will eliminate inconsistent production and allow you to accurately predict your results. Wouldn't you love to know what you're going to earn? But the only way you can do that is if you know your numbers. I'm amazed that our profession is one of the few professions where people don't know their, their numbers or their ratios or their stats. And it's a, it's a numbers profession. We're in sales. I guarantee you that if you follow the advice shared in this session, you will create urgency for your clients, for your candidates, and for yourself. And what I want to do now is I want to answer any questions that are important to you. Now, 
Um, I've had several of you ask before this even started, are you going to get a, a copy of this recording? Because I've given you a lot of information. The answer is yes. We will send you a link to the recording. If you signed up for this call, you will get a link to the recording. We have a coaching club where I do this exact type of call once a week. So once a week, I do a live call just like this every Wednesday for my training clients, and then I answer questions. I do coaching calls every other week for them. And so, and then we, it, we have this premier coaching club that is $97 a month, and you could sign up your whole entire office for $97 a month, and everybody that works for you would have access to these live calls and coaching calls. And then if you want to enter somebody in our tutor training program, you know, basically we have an 80-day program that elevates senior recruiters and teaches new recruiters. And so you, you could also put somebody in that. And what we're going to do, if anybody joins our Premier Coaching Club within the next 24 hours, we're going to basically give you three um, users where three people could enroll in our courses. But again, your entire office would have a one-week you know, one live training call and bi-weekly coaching calls. By the way, a coaching call is me getting on the phone and going, hi, it's Barb Bruno. What questions do you have? I've ha helped people close deals. I've had people come up with better resources for candidates. And, and even if you don't have a question, our, our coaching calls are phenomenal because you're learning from the questions people are asking me, just like you'll learn from questions that you'll ask me today. So you can ask me questions one of two ways. You can go to the attendee list find your name, and if you put in the telephone number, an access code, and a PIN number, and you're on a landline, I can click the hand, you know, click on that little yellow hand, I can open the line, and you and I can talk, okay? If you'd rather type in a question, I see quite a few of you have typed in questions, go down below to the control panel on the right-hand side, you see the word questions with a plus sign, okay? All you need to do is click that plus sign and open the dialog box, and you can ask me any questions that you want. If you don't want me to use your first name, I always use first names to personalize it. If you don't want me to use your first name, just put confidential or anonymous, and I will not use your first name. Okay, this is from Bob. Will this be recorded, and will we receive a copy of the recording in PowerPoint? You will not receive a copy of the PowerPoint, uh, but we will post the recording, and we will get you a link. Our, our training clients have handouts and copies of all the PowerPoints of everything I do, but when I do these free calls, what we will do is we'll set up a link, and you will get a recording of the call. Let's see. How many people do you feel someone should interview a day? That's a different answer. It depends on your niche. It depends on your position. It depends on your individual stats. You know, I can, I, you know, once you know your stats and ratios, that's when you can figure out exactly how many interviews you specifically have to do. And you know what? If you're in an office of 10 people, everybody's going to have different, different daily stats that they need to hit. And it's all about the results or inactivity. Like, you know, I'm, I monitor send out, you know, send, how many send out, send out to placement. How many interviews do you book a send out? You know, how many recruiting calls do you have to make or contacts do you have to make before somebody sends you a, a you know, resume? How many resumes result in interviews? I mean, you've got to break the process apart so you know your numbers. On the client side, it's job order to fill. It's marketing call to, you know, to hit, to, to writing an order or contract. You know, and again, some of the hints I've given you, you know, basically, um, you know, will will show you exactly what to do. This is from Valerie. Do you have pricing for solo recruiters? Valerie, the pricing, the 97 a month, is what I did for single recruiters. Um, my training product that's in here normally sells for close to $3,000. And I have so many recruiters that buy my training because they're not, they don't have a training program in, in their own office, and they'd love to get a weekly call. They want to ask questions. I've helped so many of them close deals on our questions, you know. And so that $97 a month, I actually, that is the program we have for single recruiters. The only reason I'm adding in a couple extra seats is if I have anybody on the phone that has coworkers or other people that they would like, you know, to listen to this. Um, basically, you're getting a $3,000 program for $97 a month. And so I price this, and, and we have most of our Premier Coaching Club members you know, we've got a combination of solo, you know, sole proprietors, people that are working from home because they feel alone, you know, when they're by themselves. And this makes them part of a great training community. They can interact. They can hear questions other people are asking. Then we have a lot of recruiters that have bought our Premier Coaching Club. And then I have a lot of owners that this becomes their training program. I become their weekly training call, you know, so they don't have to worry about. And by the way, all the weekly calls I do, I get the topics from our training clients. So every month I'd go out and say, what would you like me to train on? And whatever topics I get back from my training clients, those are the topics that I train on. 
So, you know, this pricing is for that solo recruiter or, you know, a firm that doesn't want to invest the $3,000. The $3,000 program is somebody that has a lot of employees and they're going to put them through and they're going to use this long term. Then it makes more sense for them to, you know, buy it outright. But I, I tried to figure out a way where how can I give recruiters access to my best training program. We've had 25,000 recruiters go through our training program, that 80-day program, and 100% of our clients have increased sales and profits. So we know that the training works. You know, just think of the benefit of having this type of training every single week. And think of the benefit of you being able to ask me to train on something specific. You know, how great would that be? You know, where, where you've got this type of training every single week. Okay, Valerie, I see you've also got your hand out. I've unmuted you. Did you have another question, Valerie? I've unmuted your line. Did you have another question? Okay, I don't hear a response. So I'm going to mute the line. Okay, I've got David. In your experience, can you say if a niche is more financially interesting than others? Any niche that stands out. Yeah, there's there's definitely some niches right now that are that are standing out. I mean, IT couldn't be hotter if it tried. You know, I mean, an IT contract as well as IT direct is doing phenomenal right now. You know, engineering, there's a tremendous shortage of engineers, both on the IT side as well as, you know, like electrical, mechanical project engineers. I mean, engineering is very hot right now. Not necessarily engineering in oil and gas. Like if you're doing engineers on drilling, that's down right now because oil and gas, because of the price prices of oil and gas right now, that niche has taken somewhat of a hit. Biotech is extremely hot accounting and finance you know some of the medical fields you know always are you know are, are extremely hot the thing is in, in medical a lot of times there's the added expense of credentialing and so you've got to be careful you know people say I want to place physicians and then I say can you afford not to earn a fee for one year because it takes 10 to 12 months to place a physician most people don't realize that you know so there's and, and I'll tell you what I want to say something to all of you I met somebody a couple years ago that places librarians and she did over 800,000 in sales placing librarians she works by herself has nobody working with her and she lives in Colorado and most of the librarians she places are in Alexandria Virginia in Washington DC because she does them in the libraries of Congress she does them in law firm libraries like I was thinking librarians are there even that many librarians out there anymore but she's known as the person the big thing is you got to get known for doing what you do what, what, what makes it hard is if you're a generalist these days you know what are you noted for what do you place so if I'm a project engineer, where am I going to go? Are you noted to place project engineers? I'm going to want to go where somebody's really noted, okay? And that's why it's, it's, it's good to be niched and niched within your niche. Stuart, I've unmuted you. I see your hand is up. Did you have a question? Stuart Z, I see your hand. I can hear you, yes. I sure can. Well, see, but that's a beautiful problem to have, and that happens to us all the time. Because the only way that a client has exclusivity to candidates is if they're either paying you a retained search firm or you're getting an engagement fee up front. Other than that, you've got to tell your clients that these candidates are actively interviewing, and you've got to keep them interviewing or they're going to find a job on their own. And I would rather have the problem of my candidate having three offers from three of my clients than to have one offer from me and two from somebody else. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to help my candidate T squared out, put all three offers and list the pros and cons on one side of the T. It'll put the client names on the top of the T, and on the left side, what's all the pluses and minuses of this job, and have them compare one offer to the other and take the offer that's in their best interest. So you're still doing the job for your candidate, but hopefully you've got two or three people in final interviews at the other clients. And so if your candidate takes an offer at, you know, client A, hopefully client B and C, the second and third is still your candidate. And see, it's a beautiful problem to have, Stuart. The problem that's happening right now, and, and I'm hearing it over and over and over again, is too often we have one candidate in the final interview. We haven't sent them any place else because, you know, we, we want it, we're saving them for one of our best clients. And then our best client drags their feet. And by the time they come around, the candidate's already accepted a job through somebody else. Because even if they're not actively looking, even if they're, they're happy, they're working, they're not looking, the minute we send them on an interview, we put that bug in their ear 
air. Now they start networking, they start going online, they start looking at, you know, uh, employment pages. Of, it's just too easy for people to find jobs on their own right now, and that's why you've got, you've got, you owe it to yourself. And that's another way where if you want to get an engagement fee, if you're trying to sell engagement fees, like a third up front, which a lot of people are doing, you know, the, 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 the beauty of an engagement fee from a client standpoint is if they pay you anything up front, you're not going to send the candidates on multiple interviews until they reject the candidate. Make sense? Any other? Hi, who is this? Oh, hi, Bridget. How are you? Well, I'm I, I'm fine. I'm glad you I'm glad you guys are on the phone. Any other questions from your group? Okay, Danny, what's your question? Awesome. What you have to do is you have to talk to your owner and manager and basically find out, you know, what their minimum standards are. And then I believe that most recruiters have their financial thermostat set too low. You know, top production in our profession right now is considered anything 350 to 400 and above. Under that is considered average. And I don't know anybody that wants to be average. Now, maybe your numbers in your office aren't that high. And so if you say, I want to do 400000 my first year, your owner might go, wow, that's really a stretch. But there's people that do that in their first year. You know, so it's where's your financial thermostat? See, I know that none of you are going to produce those kinds of numbers unless you can, if you know what's in it for you. Like everybody listening to me right now, hopefully you've got 10 non-negotiable goals posted with four or five dated action items under each goal where you're working your phone. So every day when you're picking that phone up or you're prepping at night or that, you're doing it because you want to buy a car or you're doing it because you're trying to save up money for a house or you're trying to send your kids to college. See, you can be a really high achiever your first year. There's no limits on what you can do. But what I would do, Stuart, is I would find out what are minimum standards from my owner and then I would ask them, what is, what is the best, you know, who, who jump started the fastest out of anybody that's ever worked for you? Who, who did the most? And why do you think they did that? What did they do to be able to achieve that? Because I don't want to, if somebody gives me minimum standards, to me that's like the bottom of the barrel. I don't want to be minimum standard achiever. You know, I don't think any of us want to do that. You know, but you've got to be realistic. And some disciplines take longer to get up and running. If the hiring process is seven weeks and you're only doing direct placement, you're not going to make a placement your first month because, just because of sheer, you know, the sheer numbers. But the quickest way to get up and running is to work the hottest orders in-house, Stuart. It's to really get to be a, you know, a great recruiter, great at getting talent, and working on the hottest orders in health. And also, watch where the top producers in your office are putting their efforts. Watch what orders they're filling. Don't mirror their work habits. Because when you get good at this, your work habits, you know, pretty much suck. Because you know, you, you don't have to make as many calls because you know who to call and how to call. And if a new person mirrored the work habits of the top producers, they'd fail. Because you've got to make whatever you see everybody in the office doing, Stuart, you've got to make five times more calls than everybody in that office if you're the newest person. Because that will help you succeed. And, and bottom line is, you have to put all your focus on getting candidates in front of hiring authorities. That's a send out. So your job, no matter what your job is, client development, recruiter, no matter what you're doing, your job is to get people in front of a hiring authority. That's everybody's job. And if you want to have a better month next month than you did this month, get more people in front of a hiring authority. And see, to do that, you have to have a candidate, you have to have an order. You know, so if you focus on my job is to book send outs, and when you're doing your planner, when, you're, when you arrive at work in the morning, where's my send out today? You know, that's when that's when the job becomes fun. So you can write, you could interview 100 people, you guys can write 50 orders, but unless you match and unless you send people out, nothing happens. And so I would really focus on the send out numbers. I'd sit down with my owners and managers. I would want to know the numbers of the best, best new person, who had the best first year, and how did they do it. And that's who I would try to be, Stuart, because truthfully, there's, you know, I know some, I just got off the phone with one of my friends in Houston, and he hired a guy last January, and he did 410 in 2014, and he is their top biller in his office. And he said, everybody else is like, what is that guy doing? Like, all of a sudden, all his experienced people are chasing this new guy, 
because he just figured it out. And he, he came out of a profession that was very numbers oriented. He came out of financial services and he realized it's a sales game and so it's numbers. And once he knew his numbers, he just put in whatever he had to do to hit the numbers. So your owners and managers can guide you, but make sure you, you your financial thermostat is not set low. You know, most of us are financial thermos pardon me? Yes. It's either 410 is either billings or it's gross margin of profit if you're doing uh, temp or contract. It's the GMP. Or it's billings if you're doing, you know, billings. But I mean, a brand new guy, brand new field. You know, he, he's not placing in financial services either. He came out of financial services and went into a firm placing real estate executives. Okay. All right. Thanks. I'm glad you guys joined us today. All right. Let me mute your line since nobody else has questions. Let me see if I've got any other hands raised here. Hold on a second here. Okay, I see Vicki. Let me unmute your lines. Vicki, I've unmuted your line. Are you there? Vicki, are you there? Vicki C? Okay, she just took her hand down. I think I just panicked her. Okay. All right, I've got one more question here. If I have questions offline about the coaching can we call yes you can actually sign up for this um, coaching club by going to that link now that link is only going to give you one seat into our tutor but since we're going to give you three if we see any orders come through we will automatically add the three seats or you see our number there you know our phone number is there that's the number to my office and you've got supported staffing and recruiting dot com so if you've got you know if you've got any questions about anything just call my office you know, go to that supported staffing and recruiting dot com or you can order just by going to that link, you know, the TPT Coaching Club dot com and sign up right online. Okay, Valerie, I see your hand is up again. Let me unmute you. Did you have another question, Valerie? I see your hand went back up. Let's see. Um, I do seminars every Wednesday. Every Wednesday I do a live seminar for my coaching calls. What I did you you mean at like I'm sorry. Oh, best live ones. You know what you should do is, I don't, the, this is going to sound really pathetic, Valerie, but I don't look at my travel schedule because I don't like my travel schedule. So if you want to know where I'm going to be, um, send a send a uh, request to support at staffingandrecruiting.com. Beth Matthews is my business manager, and she can give you all the lives. I know that next week, I think the next place I'm going is Newark, New Jersey, but I'm doing an in-house. Yeah, I'm doing an in-house for a specific company so they're bringing me in to do I'm doing one day of training and then I'm doing one day of, of just spending time with each one of their people and then giving them you know individual tips so that's an in-house but I've got many con conferences I'm doing this year Valerie if you just um, contact Beth she can give you that information okay you're welcome you're welcome okay let me uh, this is I got a, I have a question from Anne. when you say I take my direction from you doesn't this give them more control who's performing for who um, I don't control my candidates, Anne, and I don't control my clients. I don't believe you can control another person. All I want is um, what people want three things from us. This, these are our candidates. They want to know three things. In fact, every human being that you interact with wants to know three things. They want to know, number one, do you care about me? Number two, can I trust you? And number three, are you going to do what you're telling me you're going to do? Okay. We call these people half the time on their jobs. They don't know us. They don't like us. You know, we, and, and too often we make calls like everybody else. We, we don't share our personal brand. You know, you don't know how to go out there and, and in the first few seconds show them the differentiator. And so when you say things like, I take my direction from you, are they telling you how to do your job? No, they're not. But they're telling you what's most important to them. You know, and you're asking them better questions than anybody else is asking them. You know, when I ask somebody, give me the five things you change about your job if you were your boss, I know exactly what they're looking for. Plus, I'm going to back that up with, you know, why have you accepted jobs in the past and what must be there for you to accept a job today? You know, and I say I take my direction from you because it makes the other person feel important. Just like when I leave voicemails, you know, um, and if somebody, if I go to call somebody and I get somebody's assistant and then I get the voicemail, well, the first thing I'm going to do is hit zero. Because I don't want to leave a voicemail. I want to talk to that person. So if I get back to the assistant, I'm going to say, when are they going to be there? You know, what's the best time to call? You know, I, I hate to leave a voicemail because I'm in and out a lot. But if I'm going to leave a voicemail, I'm also going to tell them to interrupt me when they call me back because I don't want to miss their call. I'm going to make them feel important because then they call back. 
you know, again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm addressing that what, what's in it for me. Because, Anne, pretend I called you and you didn't know me. And, I, and I'm talking to you, and I'll say, you know, Anne, I'll be honest with you. You know, what I want to do is take my direction from you. You tell me what's most important to you. I'm only going to call you when I have that type of opportunity. You know, tell me the companies you would never work for and why. That, that helps me fine-tune the search. Are there some companies you'd like me to target for you? You sound different than everybody else out there. But when you say I take my direction from you, they're, they're not going to tell you how to run your business, but they're going to be more inclined to open up. People work with who they like. And so you've got to make me feel comfortable. I want to know if I can trust you, if you care about me, and if you're going to do what you're telling me to do. And understand something. Right now, 95% of the people out there that come to staffing and recruiting firms are not happy because we don't find them a job. When I first went into this, I thought we helped everybody. I almost lost my business, my first year in business, because I was focusing all my time on the people that really needed me until it finally dawned on me, wait a minute, my clients won't hire these people. I mean, I feel sorry for them. I'm trying to help them, but nobody's going to pay me a fee for them because I hadn't worked at a firm before I opened my own. You know, and so I, I had the total misconception that we help everybody. If you provide resources for them, you can help everybody, you know. Um, Okay, this is from Phil. What type of resources can we provide? You can give them lists of places they can go. You can give them websites. We actually created a career portal. We have a career portal called Happy Candidates. And they don't know it's called Happy Candidates, but it's a career portal that, that there's a resume builder. We do weekly calls for them, and we give them all kinds of resources and information. In fact, I private label those for staffing and recruiting firms. So if you don't have a resource, you, know, you can call us about that, too, or go to www.happycandidates.com. It's candidates with an S, and you can see information. Or you could look at what we have, and then you could create something similar. But now we help everybody. You know, we either place them or we send them to our career portal, and we get referrals. Everybody loves us. And it's funny, the people that own our career portals, they're getting thank you notes from people they used to ignore. But you, you, you can't spend time with those people because you don't have the time. And, and this is such a candidate-driven marketplace, you've got to focus on those people you're going to place in jobs. So, you know, Phil, if you've got more questions, just call my office or go to that website. Or we can even give you a login to our career portal where you can go in and, and register as a job seeker and see what it does. We have no problem doing that. So if any of you want that, you know, and we will send all of you a link to this call. You will all have a link to this call. Okay, I'm getting a bunch of thank yous right now, and I, I appreciate that. And um, let's see. Okay, I see no more questions. Let me see if there's any other hands being raised. I see no hands being raised. We are at the top of the hour, so I've taken an hour of your time. Thank you for joining me. I hope that you got something out of this call. And remember, the only power is you have to, you have to figure out what is the one idea you're going to implement in the next 21 days. One idea for the whole call. And commit to making that change for 21 days. Wouldn't it be amazing if you took three ideas from this call and you implemented one in February, one in March, and one in April? Imagine what that would do. I mean, either, again, you can all have a record year. Everything out there will let you have a record year. And if you want to have this type of call every week from me, if you want to interact with me six times live a month, which is what my clients do, my clients do, then just go to TPT Coaching Club and sign up. And again, in the next 24 hours, you could put three people through our training program, you know, rather than just one. And so that's, that's you know, that's a $150 bonus right there. All right, everybody, thank you for joining me. I hope you all have a record year, and I can tell you my commitment to my training clients this year is that I'm going to help them all have a record year. I don't care what I have to do. We're going to all have a record year this year. So I, I wish the same to you, and I sincerely hope that you consider our coaching club, and I thank you for joining me today. Thanks, everybody.